Dzień dobry Państwu, nazywam się Ewa Sufin-Żachmat. Witam Państwa w imieniu Rady Dyrektorów Zielonej Fundacji Europejskiej GEF oraz w imieniu Fundacji Strefa Zieleni. Ten webinar jest pierwszym z polskim webinarem w międzynarodowym projekcie o tytule Feminist in the Climate Movement. Jest to projekt, w którym wiodącymi partnerami są Zielona Fundacja Fińska Wizjo oraz Green Economics Institute z Wielkiej Brytanii, a partnerami poza Fundacją Strefa Zieleni jest belgijska fundacja Think Tank Zielony Think Tank Oikos. Zielone ruchy, jak Państwo wiecie, zajmują się klimatem od zawsze i jest to jeden z filarów zielonej refleksji myśli i transformacja, która musi się dokonać w najbliższych latach, tym bardziej w związku z Europejskim Zielonym Ładem i z przewidzianymi na to środkami, z perspektywy zielonej, które są to ruchy, które są bardzo sfeminizowane i od zawsze walczące również o prawa kobiet i o miejsce kobiet w społeczeństwie, w życiu społecznym i w polityce. Wiadomo, że te dwie perspektywy muszą być dla nas zbliżone i iść razem w parze. Stąd taki właśnie projekt, w którym nasi fińscy partnerzy organizują szkolenie ogólnoeuropejskie dla ambasadorów, feministycznych ambasadorek klimatu. Zielona Fundacja Europejska jest razem z drugim partnerem Green Economics Institute organizuje tak zwany Climate Hub w przygotowaniu szczytu klimatycznego w Glasgow, który nie mógł się odbyć w roku 2020 ze względu na COVID i który odbędzie się pod koniec tego roku. Więc wpisujemy się w te wszystkie wydarzenia i od, z różnych perspektyw szukamy właśnie związków między feminizmem i prawami kobiet, a e, e, zmianami klimatu i konieczną proklimatyczną transformacją. Ja oddaję głos Oli Kołeczek, która, Aleksandra Kołeczek, która jest e, prezeską Rady Fundacji Strefa Zieleni i jest zieloną polityczką i aktywistką i będzie moderowała to spotkanie. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you, Eva, for this introduction. Um, Starting with our panelists, um, um, first of all, I would like to say that we are very grateful that you accepted our uh, invitation and you found some time for, uh, for this webinar with us. Um, I would like to briefly uh, introduce you uh, to our guests. Um, so with us, uh, we have uh, Miłka Stempień. Uh, from Poland, uh, who is a social and political climate activist working on uh, just transition of uh, coal regions in Poland. Uh, and um, is well linked to uh, environmental protection, public transparency and civic participation. Uh, she's the chair of association Akcja Konin, Konin in Action and a co-spokesperson of the European Green Party's conciliation panel. Um, uh, welcome, Yuka. Hello. Uh, hi, thank you very much for inviting me today, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Great, thank you. Um, from Czech Republic, uh, our, um, our guest is uh, Itka uh, Nestersova. She is a long-term environmental activist, art and fundraiser by profession. Uh, she has uh, worked for almost 13 years for Greenpeace and uh, other NGOs. Uh, she uh, is um, also a part of uh, movement Limit uh, Yismany, uh, which is an open grassroots um, civil movement fighting for phase out and just transition. Uh, she's also a member of uh, the Green Party 
and has served as a deputy, deputy chair of energy working group in the past. Thank you and uh, welcome to our webinar. Thank you and thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, last but not least, of course, uh, is uh, our guest from Germany, uh, Katrin Ulik, uh, who is a candidate of the Green Party in the upcoming uh, federal election in September 2021. <laughs> yes, uh, fingers crossed. Uh, she has worked on uh, climate change and mitigation and adaptation issues on the transformation of the energy sector. Uh, and the corresponding structural, structural, structural change uh, on a re regional, national, and international uh, level. Uh, she's also an uh, ex uh, spokesperson of uh, the, the Green Party in Bonn, as I understand, not anymore, but uh, now I, uh, I understand that you have more time for, um, for your campaign and working on, uh, um, on the issues of just transition. Uh, welcome. We are very happy that uh, that you are here with us. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So to start, um, we have a very interesting situation. Uh, three wonderful uh, activists and experienced uh, uh, um, experienced uh, politicians who um, uh, who work. Uh, just transition, but in uh, three different countries, in uh, Poland, uh, Germany, and Czech Republic. Uh, so I would like you to uh, briefly uh, uh, tell us uh, what is your experience with uh, transition uh, in, uh, in your country, in your region, and do you consider it uh, just? Do you consider it uh, um, accessible? Or also uh, when it comes to participation, of women and other minorities. Um, Yuka, would you like to start? Um, okay, so I will start um, a little bit with uh, saying something about my experience um, uh, with Just Transition. So um, I have been working on Just Transition in uh, mostly in my region, which is the lignite mining region uh, in uh, central Poland. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Eastern uh, Wielkopolska, so Eastern Greater Poland, let's say. Um, and this is a region which has been mining lignite uh, since the 1960s, uh, and uh, there are still three um, open pit mines currently running. Uh, two of them will be closed uh, uh, probably this year, um, then there will be one left. Um, until very recently, so um, practically until uh, we started getting involved in the whole issue, which is in 2017, uh, there were plans to continue uh, with the lignite extraction and with um, uh, maintaining the lignite run energy plants here in the region until at least uh, 2040 or further. Uh, they were modernizing the energy plants, they were making plans for uh, new open pits. And just very recently, that's uh, last year, uh, they, made the, they came to the decision to um, cease uh, the extraction of, uh, of lignite. And um, uh, we are currently one of the most, um, um, I would say, ambitious regions in Poland in terms of um, um, moving away from uh, coal mining and from uh, the burning of coal. So uh, the plan for uh, our region uh, currently states that we will be um, backing out of uh, all coal burning and, uh, by 2030, and so we will be moving towards uh, climate neutrality by 2040. Um, so from the perspective of my region, um, I would have to say that um, these changes have been very, very rapid. When I was starting in 2017 with um, campaigning for um, uh, phase, the phasing out of coal, um, it was completely inconceivable, even for me, that in a few years we would come to the point where we would be talking about climate neutrality in my region. Um, it is a region that has undergone a very rapid transformation in terms of the political and social approach uh, to coal phase out. Um, and uh, currently we are in a process that I would also say is probably one of the most uh, ambitious and participatory processes in Poland uh, because uh, 
Um, we have we are working currently on a plan for the just transition in my region. Uh, it's an open um, uh, round table type of, um, of uh, process. So um, anyone who registers that wants to take part in the conversation about how this just transition is supposed to take place can and is um, enabled to, to take part. We have a very transparent um, uh, process in terms of access to documentation and to the plans that they, are, uh, that they want to um, um, implement within the next year. And we have influence on changing and um, uh, modifying the plans that are uh, being created. So I would say that in this form, uh, it is openly accessible. Um, one of the noticeable things in terms of accessibility for women is the fact that unfortunately so far there are quite few women participating. Um, but this is not, I would say, because there is no access to it, but because of the specifics of what we are dealing with. So this is an energy transition. Um, we have uh, mostly people connected to the energy plants and to the mines um, who want to participate in the process. Most of the women are connected to NGOs, so like me. Uh, so we bring in the additional, I would say, ecological or uh, climate uh, aspect into the discussion, uh, pushing very strongly for uh, an approach where ecology and um, maintaining, um, for example, the, the water levels in the region are being taken uh, into account within the process. Um, and um, in terms of Poland as a whole, um, I would say, unfortunately, that our region is, um, um, is quite an exception, uh, because in a lot of regions in Poland, we have um, at least six uh, um, running uh, coal regions within within Poland. Uh, there are also some regions that have, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, moved away from coal. Um, there, is, there is very little um, openness to a participatory process. Uh, so this makes it unjust, I would say. Um, it is most often closed off um, to people who are in a decision-making position anyway. So this means that um, NGOs or um, social groups that want to participate in the project are not really allowed to do so. And they're also not very ambitious goals uh, in terms of where um, uh, these regions want to go uh, concerning um, the coal phase out. Uh, so in some regions, they're even saying that they want to um, keep coal until 2060 or even longer. So um, the conversation is quite difficult, depending on the region in which uh, we are talking about in Poland. And of course, on the government level, as we know, I think uh, on, on a European level as well, uh, Poland has not yet committed to climate neutrality. And this is an ongoing discussion also on the European level in terms of talks between the Polish government and the European, uh, gov uh, the European uh, Parliament and European uh, bodies. Uh, pushing for uh, climate neutrality. And I think I'll finish with that for now. Thank you. Thank you for this comprehensive insight. Um, now maybe let's move to Czech Republic. Yitka, would be, you would be so kind to introduce uh, the situation in your country and your experience uh, with yeah, the transition? Yes, I will. Uh, it was very interesting to, to hear what Milka was talking about because our experience in Czechia are very different to her region. And it's much more similar to how you describe the, the rest of Poland. Uh, maybe one very important uh, thing that I see, because I, I've been with environmental movement for 20 years now, approximately. And it's funny because I started more as a, like an NGO worker. I, as, I, as you said, I, I worked for Greenpeace for a long time. But now I'm uh, like really just like a volunteer and voluntarily part of, of, the, of the movement that, that I found like uh, extremely important. And uh, as I was very similar, uh, there is a lot of uh, women in the movement, a uh, lot of women in the NGOs, even like uh, in positions like energy campaigners, etc. So there is definitely no problem with uh, any kind of uh, women inclusion in, uh, in, uh, in, in the movement itself. And in fact, I'm, I'm really grateful because, in fact, uh, most of the people who, who are active in Limitis Mami in our movement are one generation younger, like, you know, 25 or early 30s. And they are just like 
open-minded Europeans that are that we at the beginning wrote down the manifesto that were really inclusive uh, movement that you know ban all the forms of any kind of uh, you know uh, exclusion of for whatever reasons etc. So there is no problem. The problem is on the of course on the political level or or the on the state level. Uh, there is no participation at all. I would uh, I would say when we when we talk about uh, transition. Of course, there are some mandatory steps that, for example, are required by European Union and etc. So my exp- ex- uh, my experience is that, that there are some kind of participatory events organized by uh, by the you know regional authorities, whatever. But it's more like we need to prove that we tried rather than we are interested to know what our citizens uh, want to say or what, what uh, how they want uh, to be included in the, in the process. But there is at least one very inter- uh, important thing. As I said, I'm in the movement for 20 years. And for most of the time, the whole discussion about coal was, should we destroy more villages and open more coal mines? So until 2015, and in fact, our uh, our movement was kind of born from uh, from one of the attempts of our government in 2015 to to open a new coal mines and to even you know uh, destroy the cities for 2,000 people or something like this, and and it created quite a big public pressure. We partially win in this uh, in this battle five years ago, and since then we really see the change of the whole narrative. So now everyone accepted that the transition is going on. But unfortunately, in Czechia, it's more spontaneous process because just like the coal mining companies are bankrupting or they are not able to, to, to work on the open market anymore, it's top to be profitable. So they know that they are going to end. And by the way, uh, in coming weeks, Czech, uh, uh, Czech government even organized the coal commission inspired by Germany. And in coming weeks, uh, Czech government will be deciding whether the Czech coal exit will be in 2033 or 2038. And it seems uh, in in last days, it seemed that that even the 2033 can be approved. But we had a change in the government just yesterday. And unfortunately, the Minister of of, uh, Healthcare uh, was dismissed. And he was, of course, supporting the the, the, the shortest uh, possible coal exit. So the discussion, I would say that there is no discussion. There is just like the acceptance that there is a process going on. And the most, uh, the, the biggest part of the discussion, if there is any discussion, it's about how to spend European money. So it's all about there will be a big amount of money coming. So let's spend it somehow. And there is no vision. There are no strategic uh, goals, uh, anything like that. So it will be some kind of random spending. And there is a really big fear that instead of supporting small businesses or medium businesses or local communities, community energy energy and things like that, uh, it might quite big portion of this money might end up uh, at the the coal, uh, the current, you know, coal mining companies with some, you know, projects for uh, like transitional projects or whatever. So. So the biggest discussion here, if there is any, it's just like what to do with all the money coming in, unfortunately. Thank so you. yeah, Thank just you. the last thing, like women are not, exp- uh, not, are not exclu- mm-hmm. uh, excluded in the discussion because no one really is, so. Uh, okay, thank you. thank you very much. Uh, and now maybe let's go to uh, Germany uh, to, to hear Katrin. Uh, because I, I would assume that the situation might be a bit different uh, since uh, the Greens are... The discourse about phasing out coal is not not new. It's a mainstream idea. Uh, but still, do you, do you consider it uh, just a transition process? And what is your experience? Um... As Jitka mentioned, we had a coal commission in Germany. Um, They presented their results in the beginning of 2019. And it still took um, the current government over a year to present, uh, or almost a year, to present a draft for a coal phase-out bill and over a year to pass it in parliament. So since last summer, we do have a uh, law that phases out coal. Um, the deadline to phase out coal is 2038, 
with an option to move to 2035. Um, in our view, that wasn't enough, especially because the government did not fully translate the results of the coal commission into the coal phase out bill, the coal phase out law. Um, they especially scratched parts that were um, in favor of climate mitigation. They changed the phase out of the plans and moved especially the lignite coal plans to a later date than the coal commission uh, suggested. Um, especially grassroots organizations, which were also part of um, the coal commission, were left out of the um, deciding process for the structural change funds, which um, in turn means, because especially in grassroots organizations or the people doing work at the ground towards the coal phase out are women, um, that women were left out of the decision making process, like from that perspective. Um, we also have, a, the, like, in addition to the coal phase out law, um, the, the parliament passed the structural change bill that um, asserts funds to the affected regions. We are not only phasing out lignite, we are also phasing out hard coal power plants. Um, certain areas where the hard coal power plants mean a lot of revenue for the cities also get some kind of support, but the main focus of, on the structural change bill is on the lignite coal regions. We still have three active regions in Germany. One is in the Rhine area where I live, one is in the middle of Germany, and one is in Saxony and um, I'm not sure, Brandenburg, um, I'm not sure what the term is in English. And um, each of these states get a certain amount of money to use for the structural change. And then the lump sum of additional funds comes from the federal government directly for projects that are, are part of the structural change bill. And we as a Green Party have criticized that in the structural change law now, um, the main focus is on traditional infrastructure like um, roads, that there is no focus on renewable energy, that a lot of the, um, the interesting projects concerning climate mitigation or a change in behavior towards climate neutrality did not make it into the um, structural change bills, so there's no direct funding. And when it comes to transparency, um, the sum that comes from the federal government directly into the regions, um, which projects are supported by those sums um, is decided by a certain committee that includes members of the federal government and members of the state governments. So there is no inclusion from grassroots organization um, there is, um, well, there is transparency in a sense that the project the, the committee decides on will be published on a website, but how they decide on it, which criteria um, they use to decide on the project um, is not ob obvious. So um, it's limited transparency and um, none of the people on the ground are included in this decision-making process. Um, so a lot of the people that actually work towards a just transition, a good structural change within the region um, have been women, well, also men, but a lot of women, um, there are still people fighting to keep, um, keep their homes, a lot of the spokespeople um, in that movement are women. And um, the guy, well, we just learned last December that despite the fact that the last villages in my region can be saved, if you actually had, if the government actually had used the suggestions by the Coal Commission um, so that nobody would have to lose their house, their home, um, they decided on actually writing into law that that lignite mine 
has full rights to um, be fully used until the end. So people will, um, will have to fight to keep their homes now. Um, and they did not actually use the suggestions by the Coal Commission to prevent that. And I personally think that um, is one of the sad, uh, one of the things that the um, coal phase out law, even though we have one, um, really, really misses that the focus that wasn't on what the regions actually have and need, but more um, on how can we um, phase it out in a slower matter and in a longer period of time. That's my feeling. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I see that we already uh, have some questions in the Q&A section. Thank you very much uh, for, for those questions. Uh, we are going to uh, get to them really soon. Um, but first, I would, I would like to uh, ask you uh, one more uh, question about um, um, the on uh, on uh, on coal phase out and uh, just transition. Uh, what do you think uh, are the most important aspects? Um, because when we look at the research, uh, I think uh, in Poland, but I guess uh, it's everywhere, women are uh, those who are more concerned about the environment. They are um uh, they they care about uh, um, climate change and uh, they they uh, should be more included uh, in general um and uh, they are not as as you said uh, as as much as they could be uh so um Luca, i would like to ask you and uh, maybe also if you could mention because uh, we heard that you are also a part of a very interesting uh, project of Heinrich Böll Stiftung uh, about uh, Ecological Academy of Women. Um, maybe you could also say a few words about that. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, okay, um, I uh, well, I would like to go to one thing that Yitka was saying, um, that um, one of the reasons that the process is moving forward in the Czech Republic uh, is because they know that it's going to end. So um, uh, this is something that very much uh, informed the process also in Poland. Uh, the only reason that I think that it has moved so, uh, uh, so fast within the last um, year or two is because they realized that with the current prices of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, maintaining um, a coal-based um, uh, process in in Konin, for example, in the place where I live, uh, is not economically viable. Uh, so I wouldn't say that the the wonderful process that has been on, going on here is because um, um, people here are more progressive. I would say it's more that they are very much focused on the possibility of getting just transition funds uh, that will help solve the problems of the region. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily see this as something negative. Um, I think it's um, um, it's important to realize that this is not uh, because the politicians or um, or local governments realized that it would it, it's important to move away from coal for ecological reasons or for climate reasons. They do it purely or mostly for economic reasons. But um, I think uh, in some ways, when you are within this process, it's not really important why some people uh, get there, but important that we can sit down at the table and start talking about it seriously. Uh, because as I said, a couple of years ago, it was completely unimaginable. Uh, so what are the important aspects of a just transition? Um, I think I would very much agree with, agree with what Katrin was talking about, um, decision-making. Uh, because um, uh, while, again, I, I have to say that in terms of um, a comparison in Poland, as far as the participation of various groups within the process, uh, we're doing fairly well. Um, one of the problems or threats that we've noticed is that um, uh, the decision-making process itself, the ultimate um, 
uh, plan that will be put into place, which kind of um, uh, projects will be financed um, is not fully transparent. Uh, the criteria seems to be um, uh, not very clear. Uh, it seems unclear who exactly and in which method they, it will be decided. Um, so in some ways, uh, again, going to what Yitka was talking about, um, there is a sense that these um, meetings, um, the, uh, because they are expected by the European Commission, the, 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 the inclusiveness of the process is part of the uh, expectations to get money, for example, from the Just Transition Fund, that this is done more um, as a facade uh, that um, um, here we are, we're talking with everyone and we're taking into account all the decisions, uh, all the pr proposals, but unfortunately, the decisions themselves uh, might not be as inclusive uh, or as um, um, uh, representative as they should be. Uh, so, so this is uh, definitely one of, one of the issues. Um, uh, another important aspect of uh, the just uh, transition uh, process, I think, is um, the, the realization that uh, we have, um, because we are fighting for um, uh, from different perspectives, so you have people who are fighting to maintain their jobs, for example, people who work in the energy plants, people who work in the mines, uh, you have people who are fighting to maintain uh, certain economic stability or re economic development from their perspective. So they want to focus on investments. Um, and I would say we, you have this third group that wants to um, focus more on a sustainable approach uh, to the changes that will be um, going on uh, and focus more on uh, reversing or mitigating at least uh, the, the, the climate uh, problems that we have right now. Uh, an important aspect of the just transition process is that all these three aspects are in fact treated as um, equal, uh, because um, uh, from my perspective, I would love if the ecological aspects would be treated as the most important, but then the process will not work. It is a round table talk. It is a talk where we have to take into account these different, um, uh, different aspects. Um, and a negative aspect as well is the fact that uh, in Poland, especially ecological aspects are in fact treated as the least important. Uh, so from the perspective of reality, what we need to get to is a point where ecology is treated as at least equal, uh, if not more important than the other aspects, but we're not there. We're not there because if you go into those uh, roundtable talks, what you will hear from most of the people who have de decision-making uh, capabilities is that they want uh, job, uh, jobs and uh, the economy to be treated as more important than ecological issues. Um, it's typical in Poland to say, you know, we'll take care of the ecology later when we become a rich country. <laughs> so this is unfortunately part of our uh, mythology of, of the transition, the transformation uh, that we went through as a country from, uh, from socialist times into capitalist times. And um, so those are the two aspects that I would mention. I could mention a lot more, but that would be over uh, talking too much. Um, I would like to answer one of the questions because uh, Anna Filipa Costa asked uh, about advice for young women who are starting their path in the climate justice movement. Um, and in this way, I will um, uh, draw together the topic of the Ecological Academy for Women, which is a wonderful project that is uh, taking uh, place. They're opening actually today uh, registration. Um, it's a project for women of all ages um, uh, also women who are new to the climate movement uh, to offer them support and networking uh, for um, developing their ideas and, um, uh, uh, and giving them a foundation uh, um, in terms of uh, what they need to know, the context that they need and the moral and uh, network support that they need in order to uh, become stronger within the climate movement. So my answer to that would be um, find a group that you feel comfortable with uh, that can help you, first of all, find out what is needed within the climate movement and how you can participate within it. And there are a lot of different groups. So you have uh, the youth, uh, 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 strike, the youth um, climate strike, 
you have uh, uh, the different uh, groups for, for example, parents for the climate, uh, even grandmothers for the climate, I, or grandparents, I think. No, grandmothers, I'm sorry, in Poland. Uh, but you also have groups like uh, Ekologiczna Akademia Kobiet, or you have uh, the different um, uh, local groups, which also uh, try to do what they can within uh, the places where they're living in order to, um, uh, to help uh, change the situation. And you can do anything from just uh, helping with social media to becoming very much involved like uh, Yitka or Katrin or me are, are at the moment, depending on your time possibilities and your, um, uh, your, your skills and, and capabilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Milka. Um, and maybe uh, let's ask Yitka the same question. Uh, about the feminist uh, perspective on just transition, you can also relate a bit to what are the practices in uh, in Limites Meme. As uh, mm -hmm. I heard, uh, this is quite a democratic organization that uh, allows also women to participate in many actions, even in civil disobedience, uh, which uh, was yeah. quite surprising for me. Yeah, in fact, I was the one who blocked the digger <laughs> in a, yeah. And by the way, it was a really great uh, feeling when you climbed the digger and you stopped the whole coal mine. And you, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's true. In fact, like Limitis Meme is a, a grassroots uh, movement, but many of us has uh, some connection or history with, uh, with like the uh, environmental NGOs, like, uh, you know, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, or, or, or many, many other. But at the same time, Limit is when we were able to attract a lot of like newcomers for the new, for the movement. Like usually young people, there is a lot of university students uh, who are part of it. We also kind of, uh, some of our uh, comrades uh, were in fact uh, the first uh, guys who started Fridays for Future movement uh, in Czech Republic. So there is, in fact, we are a very small country. We are just 10 million people, so sooner or later, you will know all active people and everyone who is kind of around uh, in, uh, uh, in the green stuff. And the thing is that, yeah, uh, surprisingly, there is in, in, in Limited Summit, there is quite a lot of uh, women. I would even say that we might be like 50-50, like in, in, uh, in, in genders. And uh, some, some of, the, some of the, the activists are really, because in fact, like what we started to do, how, how the Limitless Meme started was in 2015, as I said, when uh, there was a campaign against the destruction of the, of the homes. And then uh, in 2016, uh, many of us went to Germany to Ende Gelände in uh, Brandenburg, uh, near to Cottbus. And we were really inspired by Ende Gelände and the uh, civil disobedience actions. And we saw that this is exactly what Czech Republic needs to like really start the public debate, to really do something big and spectacular, to really, you know, bring attention to, to coal mines. So, and there was a lot of, you know, uh, women uh, involved in all the, even building the Klima camp, uh, logistic, and even in the direct action. Again, I would say that maybe half of the participants in the first uh, first big action when 150 people uh, stopped the, or blocked the coal mine, there was a really high high portion of, uh, of women. And I think that it's because it's uh, really, as I said, inclusive movement. So we really, and, and we work uh, hard on like really having some processes that will help newcomers to feel comfortable because sometimes it tends to that there is a group of people who know each other and, and it's very, very difficult for new people to kind of join and, and get involved and have feeling that they are uh, that they are part of the movement. So we really spend a lot of time on uh, working with the new, we have this body system. So if you are new, you immediately have a friend who will, you know, help you to get oriented, to know how we communicate, what's the best way, how, how to get involved, etc. So I think that there is quite a lot of attention to to, to it. Uh, but what I would like to mention as an uh, as a answer to your question is that there is one very important aspect uh, that is related to uh, just transition and Czech Republic. And it's uh, related to the very bad structural problems that all the three coal regions are facing at the moment. Because uh, all of them uh, have unfortunately the same characteristics. It's uh, uh, very low wages, 
very low level of qualification education, a very high level of poverty. And uh, it's, uh, it has many historical consequences because all these regions, uh, they are in fact bordering with Germany or with Poland and they are so-called Sudeti, uh, Sudetenland. So what happened is that, uh, for example, in my hometown, that is in, in, in this, this part of the country, just 40, 40 kilometers from German borders, 90% of citizens before the Second World War were Germans. And unfortunately, after the war, all of them had to leave. So there was suddenly a big part of the country with all the factories, uh, houses, and everything, farms that were abandoned. And it was given for free to, to people who just came there. And uh, the government decided at the time to heavily industrialize these areas because there was coal. So they started to open even more coal mines. They started to build coal power plants, uh, heavy machinery, chemical industry. So all the, you know, the most polluting, in fact, uh, industry was concentrated in these places. And in fact, there was already one transition that happened in early 90s because all these heavy, heavy industry was not compatible on, uh, on the open market. So in early 90s, many of these uh, factories already uh, bankrupted. So there was a huge uh, unemployment. Uh, the unemployment just jumped up. like uh, It was like really the worst part of the country. And I think that many of the people feel kind of uh, left behind or abandoned, that they didn't really feel that they have enough support because this was like, and made a very big uh, structural changes. Maybe I think that, in fact, we don't have that big problem with uh, having too many uh, people employed in the mines because they were already fired in the early 90s. And now we have maybe 20% of the numbers that were there in, in early 90s. And unfortunately, since then, and the, the region still has this uh, legacy of, uh, yeah, low quality, like government, the former government just needed, you know, low qualified workers for the factories and for the mines. So there were never, you know, enough uh, schools, there is not enough universities, there is not enough all this, you know, infrastructure that, that help you to, to increase the, the quality of your life. And it, of course, affects uh, women a lot. And also what I see is that all the discussion about how to use money for, uh, for the transition is like that kind of male thinking. So let's, this is like a technical problem that we will solve with the great engineering skills we have. So we'll replace coal with nukes and gas, for example. Or we will, we will do some, we will build uh, infrastructure. We will build this and we will build that. But nobody is talking about, you know, like that is a structural problem and just replacing uh, coal with whatever, even with renewables will not solve all the social issues, all the educational issues. All the, there is a really big problem that there is a Roma minority. So there is also a big problem of racism, of, of them being completely excluded from all the discussions. They have no say and they are really discriminated on, on, on so many levels. And nobody is really, you know, seeing that the just transition for all these three regions mean, you know, like really dealing with all these issues that just like, you know, the new energy source will just, you know, keep people as, as, uh, as poor and as desperate as they are at the moment. Thank you, Yitka. Uh, let's, uh, let's ask uh, Katrin now. Uh, and uh, I just would like to mention that it seems that decision-making process is, um, is a huge issue, of course, uh, uh, when we listen to all the stories and uh, uh, considering that um, the Greens, I, I personally uh, know and believe that the Greens in, in Germany really work on inclusivity uh, a lot and about, uh, they care about uh, in including also women and other minorities into, um, into this decision-making uh, process. Um, do you agree and would you like to comment? I um well there is a tradition within the green party that every um official uh committee every official um election process has to include 50% women so um when we elect um election lists like we will this weekend in my state the 
always the first, third, fifth um, seat will go to a woman, while um, the even numbers um, are open for anybody to run for that. And we have, um, when we have like ha party chairs, we always have two. And one of the party chairs has to be a woman. Um, here in Bonn, um, while I was uh, head of the party in Bonn, um, we were actually two women um, because, because we both got elected. Um, the second uh, chair is open for anybody to run and I decided to run um, and was elected. So um, within the Green Party, the decision-making process um, when it comes to official committee seats um, is always, it does always include women. Um, we are trying to, um, we, have, we have committed ourselves to include more minorities, um, hear different voices, different perspectives um, in our discussions as well. Um, but um, from my experience, when I look at the other parties, um, when I look at other committees that I've worked in, I've been working within the field of the energy transition in general um, for over 10 years now. Usually we, as the women from the Green Party, are the only women at the table. <laughs> so um, there are a lot of areas um, where you still encounter a lot of like mainly men. It changes a bit when you move from the traditional sectors like coal, nuclear power, um, gas infrastructure to renewables. Um, within the, when, when we talk about the energy transition and renewables, there are a lot more women um, you meet and you talk, can talk to, while um, within the traditional more um, well, traditional fossil fuel sector, there are still um, more men that you encounter. Um, I always um, bring this one example. Um, we have a mining law in Germany, a general mining law, federal, and there was, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, a day where experts talked on the on on mining law and I went there as uh, for my work and I encountered around 120 men and one other woman. Um, so we were the only two women um, at the seminar and we talked to each other, obviously, um, but that was kind of the perspective that I got. Uh, when I first started out in the energy sector. It changed a bit um, because of renewables becoming stronger in Germany, um, that you meet a lot more women at events like that now. So, um, but I wanted to come back to um, one thing that Milka said earlier, that um, you have to bring everybody together and are, you shouldn't forget one perspective. Um, that was the reason why, uh, why people agreed to join the Coal Commission, because they figured that it would be important for every aspect to be included in the Coal Commission. And when the government went and uh, changed the suggestions or the results of the Coal Commission, um, leaning towards less climate mitigation, more towards the companies, um, that was really some well, a lot of people were really, really disappointed because they put a lot of effort um, into these very difficult discussions that they had within the Coal Commission. And I think that even the um, report they presented in the end um, was difficult for everybody on the commission to agree on, but they said, because we understand that this is a negotiation and that there are different um, perspectives um, to the topic and that obviously um, the companies will have a different perspective on this, the workers will have a different perspective on this, and we as uh, the environmental movement uh, will have a different perspective on this. Um, the people, uh, the Green Party wasn't included in the Coal Commission, but the people that were like um, coming from the environmental sector, from the NGOs, from um, the grassroots organizations, 
um, they in the end agreed to the final report because they said, okay, this is a, a result that is not ours, but that we will support, that will bring um, uh, peace to the discussion and will um, will give a result that everybody gave something, but also got something from. And then the government went and changed um, changed the commission result, um, changed the phase out path, and really the environmental movement was disappointed in the result of um, that coal phase out bill because climate change did not really seem to matter as much to the government as um, they assumed it would, I guess. So um, yeah, we are in this upcoming election, um, climate change will be one of the most important topics for the Green Party, naturally, but also because um, the energy transition has slowed down under the current government and we want to increase the amount of renewable power that we have within Germany. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll leave it to that and then come back to some other aspects with, later. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to uh, address this question about uh, advice for for women who would like to get involved because Miuka already, already mentioned this uh, um, project of Heinrich Boll Stiftung um, uh, Ecological Academy of Women, but maybe you, Yitka or Katrin, would you like to add something as experienced uh, politicians and activists? I I think Milka really gave good advice. Find a group that supports your perspective, that includes you, and don't be afraid to speak up and um, give your opinion, give your perspective. Just use the chance to also learn within the group from each other and support each other. Um, and don't be don't be afraid when you meet a lot of men in these contexts just you know as women raise your voice anyway Yitka, would, would yeah, you like I, to add something I, i'm thinking well i think that like yeah most of the things were uh, were said already okay mm. we have uh, another question uh here in the q a section uh, what are the missing subjects in just transition processes? How do you evaluate the role of energy communities or cooperatives in the just transition processes? Um, and uh, these are not um, questions for, for any um, specific speaker. So any of you, if you'd like to address them, go ahead. Um, in Germany, we, as a Green Party, we try to support energy communities um, and energy transition organized by um, the citizens. And I think that the European uh, Renewable Energy Directive really gives um, good ideas to every country um, how to support um, a change towards citizen electricity. Um, in Germany, not all of the things that the Renewable Energy Directive includes has been implemented into German law. We are trying to work on that. We hope that it will happen soon and that um, maybe with a change in government um, after the election, those um, suggestions or those regulations by the European Union, Union will be implemented in Germany. One thing that um, has really helped is that since January 1st, um, the re energy, the renewable energy bill that, ha that was passed at the end of the year in Germany um, makes solar panels on houses free of certain tariffs and um, 
and additional costs um, when they are small so that private citizens may use their rooftops to produce their own electricity. We as a Green Party would like to uh, increase the amount of kilowatts you are allowed to have up, but um, it's a good start, I think, that this is free of tariffs so that citizens will um, be able to, uh, to produce their own electricity again without paying additional costs. Um, I think that more is possible. I'm not sure about the situation in Poland and the Czech Republic, um, we have a lot of energy communities here that, um, or, or just, or like citizens that organize themselves to um, be part of the energy transition. And I think that especially re renewable energy projects um, offer us the chance to participate in the energy transitions as regular citizens. We don't have to be a big company to put a solar panel on your rooftop or to participate in a project in your hometown. Um, so that is actually a way to make the um, production of electricity more democratic, I think, because you have more, more people that participate. Um, okay, then maybe me now uh, from the perspective of Poland. Um, uh, I will also answer first the, the question of the, of the roles of energy communities or cooperatives. Um, so I would evaluate them as potentially extremely important in the just transition process. Uh, but um, uh, the fact is, is that in Poland, um, there is not enough support for this route. So um, what we've been seeing in the just transition process at the moment is more of a tendency to try and I think also Yitka mentioned this in some way um, is to try to um, exchange uh, one big centralized model of um, energy uh, provision uh, so the coal mines and the energy coal run energy plants with a new uh, big uh, source of energy instead of dispersing uh, um, the, the uh, energy sources uh, by creating energy communities and cooperatives. Um, so the main problem in Poland is that uh, in terms of the legislation and in terms of, um, um, I would say, economic even um, uh, support for such projects, um, it's still way behind, for example, Germany, um, and it is still quite difficult in Poland to establish such an energy community or cooperative. So we are slowly getting there. Uh, the problem is, in terms of the just transition process, is that it's not um, really treated by the government or even by the local governments uh, involved in just transition as a viable option. Um, so what they want to do is they want to set up um, big uh, wind farms or a nuclear power plant or, um, uh, or gas, uh, gas energy plants, etc. Uh, instead of talking about um, uh, this more dispersed uh, system of uh, getting energy uh, to our houses and to our uh, closest surroundings. Um, so um, going back to, to what you're asking is, I would personally evaluate it as extremely important, but it needs um, a social change. It needs a change in the approach that people have um, to how energy should be produced and, um, and, and, um, and also uh, sh shared basically. Because right now, what most governments want is they want to maintain control over the energy systems, and they want to also continue to make money from this. Uh, if you have energy communities or co energy cooperatives, this completely changes the whole economic situation in a country. Um, and this is why it's such a difficult conversation within the just transition process. Um, the missing subjects, I think that would be one of the missing subjects. Uh, so this is talked about, but it's not treated um, seriously by uh, people at the highest level, I would say, in Poland especially. Uh, so, like I said, uh, if you look at uh, the Polish energy plan uh, for um, uh, the, the 2050 uh, energy plan that just recently came out in Poland, it talks about um, uh, sub, uh, um, uh, 
replacing coal uh, basically with atoms, uh, with uh, atom nuclear plants, nuclear pl power plants, and with gas. Uh, so the uh, the renewables uh, are basically achievable within the next two or three years, according to this. Uh, um, so the plan is not as ambitious as reality. Um, uh, another missing subject. Uh, I wouldn't say that they are missing. I I would say that they're there, uh, but they're not being treated seriously. So like I mentioned, ecology, uh, hydrological issues. So the loss of water. Um, these are issues that we as NGOs, as environmental NGOs, bring to the table, um, but it's very hard for us to sort of um, force the other, um, um, the other participants to take them as seriously as uh, issues linked to um, job, job creation or job maintain, maintenance uh, or um, eco economic issues. Okay, uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, and I can just add that uh, in Czechia, like in fact, the situation is quite similar, like the whole energy cooperatives or the decentralization of the of the energy production is quite new topic, because as I mentioned, there is more like the, the, the government, the Ministry of, uh, of Trade and Industry, who is in charge, he says, okay, so let's, uh, let's switch off the coal power plants, but we need new nuclear reactors first, because there is like, he's extremely skeptical towards uh, renewables. And this is the whole, like the whole legislation at the moment doesn't really support uh, renewables. It's slowly changing, but it's a big fight, I must say. And there are only a few, let's say, visionaries who are who are promoting uh, energy cooperatives and, and the whole concept. Uh, these are mostly NGOs. I know that Friends of the Earth is very active in this. It's, of course, Green Party uh, in, in those places where we have uh, mayors or local representatives. We of course try to try to raise the issue of uh, energy management, uh, renewables, uh, and the saving of the energy. Because by the way, just energy savings are the biggest potential for for our country, and this is something that is completely left uh, left uh, behind uh, the, the the debate. And uh, yeah, so there are by the way the green mayor in one of the I, I said that there was a big uh, big fight or big public you know debate about the the the, the villages and endangered by coal mining. And one of them has a green mayor, and he's now working on the project of the whole uh, energy neutrality for his, uh, or like the, 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 everything will be produced in, uh, in his own uh, small city, which is a city for 2000, with 2,000 uh, citizens. So, so hopefully in a few years, we will have like a really great example, because this is something that we need. We need to show that this can work, that uh, I was, for example, amazed when I saw some presentation from Germany, how big portion of your renewable sector, in fact, is the is this like a community uh, energy that then brings you know money into local budget, because I think that here it's more about like yeah, so the big guys who are now owning the coal mine factories will then you know create a big wind parks or big solar parks or, or whatever. But there is one thing that is really important also in the debate, and it's also why we really need to go to local communities and talk to people. And it's that uh, Czech Republic has a very high potential for wind energy, but at the same time, the wind turbines are seen as ugly, destroying. It's, it's really funny because you are in the region where you just see coal, uh, coal power plants or coal mines, but people will tell you that the uh, wind turbines are ugly and will destroy the horizon or things like that. So there is a quite strong uh, resistance against the wind parks and at the same time we know that we need much more of them if uh, if we want to be uh, climate neutral so i think this will be one of the also of the of the discussions with uh, with local citizens how to how to explain that in fact they can profit from it because the, the biggest worry i think is that somebody you know some big capitalist will come will bring like build the the wine to Berzin and take all the profit and we will have nothing just you know uh, destroy the uh, nature or whatever so um, thank you. We'll be slowly going to an end of this webinar, but uh, we have one very interesting question uh, also in the chat uh, um, because our transmission is also available on YouTube and uh, there are people also put some question, questions. 
Uh, and it, uh, it uh, relates uh, ni nicely to what you have said about uh, renewable er energy. Uh, it it uh, refers to the future uh, of the coal region. Uh, what are the al alternatives, local, uh, regional economic development to replace or complete the main sector of uh, energy production? And uh, that would be more women friendly from your point of view. Mm. Who would like to start? <laughs> I would like to add something to Dietka's comments and then maybe move on to um, that question. Because we have, um, I, I found that an interesting idea that you said that um, the mayor is trying to keep uh, revenue within his community. Uh, we have a, um, a district here in my state that actually calculated how much money they can keep within their district mm -hmm. um, and within the towns in the district if they switch to renewable energy sources. And they slowly, with the money um, provided by the citizens through local ba a bank, and um, worked are working on uh, getting to a 100% renewable energy um, options within their district. Um, the local um, utility company offers special tariffs that are like from locally produced um, energy sources. And they really, really um, focused on that this is actually a question of revenue as well, whether money is going out of the district or staying within the region and uh, for local products. Um, and this isn't a region that is commonly known as very green. So um, that is actually an aspect that um, I find quite interesting that you can also look at it from a very different perspective that is not climate change and trying to uh, reduce carbon emission. Mm -hmm. um, going back to your question, Alexandra, um, which I completely forgot. I'm sorry, could you give me? <laughs> uh, what, are the, uh, what are the alternatives for the development of the, the regions, uh, coal regions or those who benefit mostly from or from uh, coal mining and uh, this, let's call it traditional way of energy production. Um, our region here, which is the region between Aachen, which is right at the Belgian border and Cologne, this is the lignite coal mining region, um, has the benefit that there are a lot of universities and research institutes around and that um, you can build on that infrastructure that is already there to try to include renewable energy sources, everything related to a just transition towards renewable energy sources in the region. There's talk about maybe um, expanding the research facilities to include different kinds of um, storage options like hydrogen and see what comes out of that area of expertise. Then um, the region already has good um, research facilities for solar power. Um, there is a wind farm testing site in the area, so you can build on existing infrastructure. The, there's a difference between us or the region here in the west and the coal mining region in the east towards uh, Poland and the Czech Republic. Um, there, it's just traditional that or it's tradition to have coal mining there and not much else. It's not as densely populated as um, my region here. So um, with the infrastructure bill that was passed with the fa coal phase out bill, there are also um, research institutes, um, ideas about um, federal institutions that might need a new location or that 
the, the federal government wants to place somewhere to go in that area to create new jobs and um, to be a starting point for other um, endeavors, startups, um, more research to um, go in that area of the country and maybe like the, the federal government places one thing there and that becomes a hub for more economic um, support. So um, I'm getting agrivoltaics. Um, there's research here, but not, um, well, it's a new idea to, in, to combine agriculture and solar panels. And I know that um, in Southern Germany, they had a very successful um, research project that um, included um, farming and, and at the same time at a two meter level solar panels above the farming uh, or the, the area that was being farmed, but it hasn't been a, like a common thing in Germany. I think there's still a lot of research that has to be done, but um, it's an interesting endeavor that we most definitely um, are looking at in Germany because solar panels on on fields um, right now exclude the use for um, farming in those fields. So that could be a combination um, as far as I'm informed. Um, it doesn't work for every kind of farming, but it's a possibility to use spaces which are limited um, for two different things. So it's definitely something that we need to do more research on and see where it takes us. Um, okay, Miuka or Yitka, would you like to also address the, the question about uh, alternative uh, ways of development also that could be potentially uh, beneficial for, for women? Um, uh, I, I'm going to answer this, uh, this question from, um, I would say, a philosophical uh, perspective. Um, one of the things I think that we have problems uh, when we're communicating with other people about, um, let's say, the, the approach that we have is that it is a complete change. It's a social and economic change um, in the sense that um, uh, this is what I said earlier. When you when you talk about um, exchanging one energy, one type of energy production with another type of energy production, um, it's it's basically maintaining us within the the, the previous paradigm of big energy uh, production. What we actually need as alternatives is we need uh, decentralized um, uh, energy. We need a decentralized approach to society as well. Okay, so um, this is very difficult to get across because um, politically what works is saying, okay, we will open a big company where we will um, uh, uh, give jobs to um, 100,000 people from the whole region and everything will be great. Um, the thing is, is that if we really want change, uh, we are going to be going towards uh, smaller uh, smaller companies, uh, so small and medium-sized companies. We will be going towards uh, energy communities. We will be going towards energy cooperatives. So it is a completely different approach to development. Uh, and I think that is more uh, women-oriented because uh, it talks less about um, huge success, but about maintaining health, about maintaining societies, uh, that are um, uh, that cooperate with each other and create uh, a local environment in which they have energy, in which they have good food, in which they have healthy air, which is a huge problem in Poland because we have smog. Uh, so uh, until we we change this approach uh, to you know what the future should look like, what development is, um, we're we're sort of talking next to each other in terms of what. The, politi the polit politicians at the top level are, are talking about and what we as activists, as NGOs, and also as Green Party politicians talk about. We're talking about um, uh, a social change as well. Uh, so my answer to you would be, it's a whole lot of small things. 
it's energy saving, it's, uh, uh, it's decentralized energy communities, it's decentralized, um, uh, a different approach to, to, to food, for example, to agriculture, where uh, our fields maintain a, a high quality of the food that we produce. Um, all of this means that when I sit down in, um, in a, 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 at a round table and I try to explain this, um, a lot of the politicians who are talking about um, development in the old sense do not understand what I'm talking about. So I think a, a very important part of our job is trying to get people to understand that. Uh, what are the alternatives? The alternatives are changing the social approach to what, what we're heading towards. And yeah, and I would like to end with that. Thank you. Yeah. I can just like, you know, sign everything that, that you said. It, it was really great. And I might just like add uh, uh, one angle from, from, from our country. And it's that, uh, as I said, all these coal regions has the same structural problem with uh, low, uh, low qualification, low level of education, big healthcare problems and everything. So uh, it's, and it's all, you know, it's, uh, it's the all outcomes of the heavily industrialization of these areas. So these, this region just like needs to deindustrialize. They can't have a big chemical factories anymore, like uh, power plants, the coal power plants can't be replaced with just other ones or whatever. And by the way, these regions where they have a very nice nature and after all the smoke is, uh, is down and we can see again, uh, these regions even have a really big uh, potential for tourism, for example, and uh, all the services related to it. And then now uh, in some of the regions where the, like there is only like last coal mine or whatever, there is a big investment in, uh, like, which is also questionable many times into you know, creating lakes instead of mines and building the infrastructure all around. So this is one, one of the options. But what is really needed is uh, having a vision, having a clear vision how we, how these, where these uh, regions want to go and having a political representation who really you know, is strong in following this vision and investing more in services, investing definitely much more in education, in requalification, but like really growing the education level, building new universities maybe, or, or better schools, is a lot about investing in social care because uh, the, the population is aging. Uh, people in this region have very specific social issues. There is a really big, uh, yeah, as I said, level of poverty. There is a big problem with, uh, unfortunately, during the 90s, many people, or during the last uh, few years, many people went uh, into the debts. So there is like 17% of the people in this region have, uh, how you call it, uh, when, uh, I don't know whether execution is the right word, it's execute in Czech, it means that you have to pay, uh, pay your debts and it's usually like three times more than what you, you know, get from not even bank, these are these like very unofficial, you know, uh, lending uh, companies, whatever. So this is all about investing in the soft projects uh, rather than building new, be, new, there is enough, uh, no, there is not enough highways in Czechia, I think it's enough, but there is like, yeah, the infrastructure projects should, are not something that they will, you know, help us uh, in, uh, in this transition, yeah. And maybe one, one last thing, uh, it's the whole problem that I now am more and more aware uh, when I think about the future of Czech Republic is that we are heavily industrialized nation now and we are the car producers. The biggest portion of our uh, of our economy is, in fact, uh, yeah, we have uh, we have Volkswagen, Toyota, Peugeot, Hyundai, Citroen. All of them are producing cars in Czechia, and the rest of the factories, mostly in this region, are producing just producing automotive parts for German car producers. So the whole dependency of the countries and these regions on something that we know that will end as well, the the cars with engines. Uh, won't be here in 10 years or 15 years. So, yeah. So everything that can kind of help us to be less dependent on, on, on heavy industry and more on services, on, uh, on, you know, education, on spending free time in a quality way and all these things, this might be uh, alternatives. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a nice way to, to finish this uh, webinar with this vision of future of uh, uh, alternative development of uh, Poland, uh, Germany and Czech Republic. 
Um, thank you very much uh, to all our panelists, our guests for very interesting questions. Um, I just uh, would like to remind you that, that this webinar was a part of, uh, of a series. Uh, this is a part of the project uh, Women for Climate. Uh, which is uh, which is uh, organized by Green European Foundation with partners such as us in Poland, uh, Strefa Zieleni. Uh, so if you want to join uh, other webinars, uh, I posted uh, um, a link in the chat. You can uh, you can sign up for a, a newsletter and uh, have updates um, about upcoming events. Uh, so again, thank you very much, and thank you to Spulnota Idei, our partner uh, responsible for technical um, uh, side of this event. Eva, would you like to add something more? Yes, thank you very much. I was really following with a big interest uh, all this. Uh, uh, this exchange and uh, just um, uh, I, I would like to underline some important uh, messages and maybe something that we should support as uh, women and uh, activists and politicians. Um, we were speaking about uh, this necessary changement of paradigm of model, economic model, going from the big industry to much more decentralized and uh, much more economy for citizens. So when we were speaking about this uh, energy cooperatives, this is something that is uh, especially difficult in post-communist country because everything that is common is communist. So for 30 years, people were, were taught to be individualist and uh, uh, they were trained to uh, to uh, work in the competition so so now uh, we must teach them again to uh, create communities and to cooperate and to create these uh, cooperative structures and here is there is a big role of women because we know that the dialogue and internal democracy is much easier when the, uh, there is more women in the, around the table. And uh, so this is something that uh, uh, we should uh, very much support. And there is hope because the, um, with the European Green Deal, uh, there are new rules uh, and uh, there, there will be legal framework obligatory for in each country for this kind of uh, structures so this is something that uh, especially in czech republic in poland maybe in hungary with our colleagues we must prepare to support and to see how we can organize event what networks how to include all the uh, all the movements or climate movements to support this uh, direction, how to go into renewables in this uh, cooperative uh, societal um, uh, and uh, 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 model for citizens, for everyone, and not only for the, for the big companies and for the richest people. So this is maybe the where the uh, to the end as uh, one uh, uh, one of conclusions from this uh, exchange. Thank you very much. Okay. And see you next uh, time uh, in uh, in uh, our green days in uh, uh, in the near the German border. Uh, we will be at the north northwest of Poland at the end of August, where there will be our next seminar uh, about uh, feminist in the climate movement. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.